Good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to the seventh BSAT online talk sponsored by Roundtree Tryon. Again, I would like to thank Jamie Roundtree for his generous support. Uh, we're delighted that leading experts in their field have accepted our invitation for, to give these talks. With the support of Roundtree Tryon, we have been able to get these talks to a much wider audience as part of our central remit which is to promote all aspects of sporting art to a wider audience. We started this series as a substitute for our program of visits, which we had to spend because of the plague. Although we are well underway in preparing a program of visits for next year, and who knows what's going to happen after last night, uh, we are planning to extend the program of online talks beyond March next year. Today, our presenter is Sally Goodseer. Her lecture is entitled Sporting Art and George IV. I have a particular interest in this lecture following the BSAT essay that I wrote with Sally Bills on boxing prints from this period a, a little while ago. Sally is the Curator of Decorative Arts at the Royal Collection Trust and a trustee of the National Horse Racing Museum at Newmarket. She joined the Royal Collection from Christie's and has curated the Buckingham Palace ex exhibitions, uh, Royal Gifts and Painting Paradise, the Art of the Garden. This year, she's been particularly busy. She curated two exhibitions, Prince Philip, a celebration at Windsor Castle and the Palace of Holy Rood House and wrote the accompanying book. She also wrote the sporting art chapter for the 2019 Queen's Gallery exhibition George IV, Art of Spectacle and Spectacle, and was a particular interest in the Royal Muse and the history of Royal Animals, right at the heart of our interests. Sally has agreed to answer questions at the end of the talk. You can put questions to her by using the Q&A button, which is at the bottom of left of the screen. You type the questions in throughout the talk. I will see them and put them to Sally at the end. So with that introduction, over to Sally Goodseer. Thank you, Sally. Thank you, Tim. And I'm just going to share my screen and show you the, the PowerPoint. So I must apologize in advance. I'm just in the final stages of a cold. So um, I think I sound slightly more adolescent male than I, I normally do. I have some honey and lemon beside me and I'm hoping those vocal cords um, will sustain me for this, for this talk. Uh, <laughs> sorry. Sorry, that's the worst I've had all morning. Um, so our image of George IV as an overweight king who inherited the throne at the age of 58, having spent hundreds of thousands of pounds on commissioning new architecture, on horses, on women, on gambling and entertaining. However, as with the traditional imagery of Henry VIII or Queen Victoria, that image of the older monarch often belies a youth spent in different pursuits and much more actively. George IV was born in 1762, the eldest of an eventual 15 children of George III and Queen Charlotte. His parents' loving marriage was relatively unusual amongst the elite and his mother's enlightened sensibilities and contact with friends and family on the continent meant that the young prince and the growing number of his siblings were taught him along modern lines of education espoused by Rousseau and Voltaire. Queen Charlotte's position as Queen Consort and her personal contentment at domesticity, albeit on a grand scale in the newly purchased Buckingham House or her renovated Kew Palace or her, or her cottage at Frogmore House at Windsor, meant that her children were relatively isolated and turned inward to each other for companionship. George became firm friends although with an undertone of competitive rivalry, with his next youngest brother, Frederick, the Duke of York. Frederick was just one year his junior. And they also socialized extensively with the next youngest brother, William, Duke of Clarence, later King William IV, and occasionally, of course, with further younger brothers. The eldest princes, oh, oh I won't move. Oh. Sorry, I can't actually move slides. 
it was just a bit slow. Okay, sorry about that. The eldest princes were probably taught to ride by Sir Sidney Meadows, an MP, an equestrian, and also the deputy ranger of Richmond Park. The boys could also take advantage of the newly built riding school behind Buckingham House, which still stands today and you can see on the right. The riding school, which has a more modern Victorian roof, may have been designed by William Chambers, but probably with significant input from Thomas Worsley, the master of the horse to George III, whose country home at Hovingham, of course, is entered through its riding school and really horses take um, precedence almost at that house. The Royal Parks and the park at Windsor also provided open space for riding. Meadows was clearly never forgotten by the prince, who as an adult acquired his portrait by George Stubbs, which you can see on the left there, which shows Meadows riding a particularly muscular cream stallion. And this might be one of the Hanoverian creams, a breed kept at the Royal Mews. Um, and of course, when I refer to the Royal Mews at this point, it wasn't behind Buckingham House or Buckingham Palace as it is now. It was underneath what's now Trafalgar Square. Um, it was a William Kent building. Um, and Mews and stabling had been there since the Tudor period, relating more to Whitehall Palace and Westminster than, of course, to St. James's and, and Buckingham House, which, which eventually became a palace. Meadows also probably didn't forget his most prestigious pupil and dedicated his 1806 book, The Art of Horsemanship, to the prince, who was then aged 44. As an adult, George was a really proficient horseman, and the skill not only enabled him to ride, to inspect troops, and to attend royal engagements, as we might even expect even today, but also to appear amongst his people by riding in the royal parks, as depicted in this painting. Oh, oh sorry. Um, as depicted in other paintings also by Stubbs. Sorry, we'll go back um, that one, for example. At, at Windsor as a young man, the prince hunted on Tuesdays or Saturdays with his father. There were several royal hound kennels which were maintained by George III and were continued by George IV, kept in different places in the Great Park. Hunting at this point was mostly for deer, usually stags, sometimes without a kill, maintaining a royal tradition which had existed since the medieval period, rather than, of course, for foxes, as we might think of today, which required a different kind of hound and, of course, more likely to result in a kill. The presence of the royal family in the Great Park at Windsor was one of the few moments during George's childhood when the children might be seen outside their palaces, and it, it um, led to people going to the parks trying to spot the children um, out riding. At the age of 19, the young prince wrote to Frederick, the Duke of York, that second brother, about the regular hunting he was enjoying at Windsor. Age 27, the prince leased his first hunting seat, Kempshot Park in Hampshire, which stood in country known for good hunting and shooting. He maintained this lease between 1788 and 95. In 95, that final year of the lease, as it turned out, he commissioned these alterations, suggestions for alterations from the architect Henry Holland, which show that um, the main house, the existing house, which is the central, the central structure um, on the left and the right, um, was of relatively moderate proportions for a, a young Prince of Wales. The alterations were not carried out, probably because in 1795 there was um, an early of, of many um, financial crisis, crises for the prince. Um, and Holland had to stop work, um, stop any developments at Kempshot, and he also had to stop work at Brighton Pavilion. The prince decided to give up Kempshot that year and moved um, for a few years to Northington Grange in the same hunting country. The prince's first pack was for stag hounds um, for hunting deer. He acquired them in 1791 and named it the Kempshot Hunt. He kept them at this house. Keen hunt followers, including the prince, often rode more than one horse in a day. The Hampshire Chronicle recounted a hunt at some length in which the stag, followed by the prince's stag hounds, circumnavigated Basingstoke. It feels quite extraordinary to, to think of now. So I quote from the Hampshire Chronicle. A stag was turned out on Tuesday before the Prince of Wales's hounds at Hackwood. The deer ran directly to the River Loddon, which he crossed between Basingstoke and Basing. He then traversed Sherborne Fields to Shotanger, thence to Worting, over the late racecourse to Kempshot, 
to Farley, Highwood, Preston Oakley, Lasham and Sheldon, where he ran into a cottage and was secured in the kitchen. The prince hired all his relay horses and was left behind in Preston Oakley, but we are happy to say that His Royal Highness arrived safely at Kempshot about seven in the evening. Only four persons remained with the hounds when the deer was taken. The huntsman tied both his horses. The Honourable Mr. Bly and many others had severe falls, but we do not hear that any bad consequences have ensued. The prince returned to town on Wednesday, and before he got into his chaise, expressed the highest satisfaction at the sport and the finest of the country. He wore the uniform of the HH, the Hampshire Hunt, and with his usual affability, conversed with every gentleman present. And interestingly, um, one of the people he hunts with is James Austin, um, Jane Austen's brother. Um, and in the Royal Archives, we have um, a wonderful account of who goes hunting with the Kempshot hunt. And James Austin's, James Austen's name appears in it repeatedly. Um, of course, Jane Austen, no particular fan of the, of the prince. Um, and certainly later was um, felt under some pressure to dedicate Emma to him um, in the in the uh, early nineteenth century. But um, I think it's I think it's quite interesting that there's this sort of contact with these sort of rascapalians in in Hampshire and James probably hearing from her brother about what goes on. But James Austen can't really afford um, enough horses. He struggles to keep up with the hunt. Loyal equestrian staff from this period remained with the prince throughout his life. The hunting groom, John Gascoigne, rose through his household and ended as clerk of the stables, which was the highest um, equestrian position a commoner could, could achieve in the royal household at that time. Gascoigne's colleague, William Anderson, succeeded him as clerk in 1812. Both men were immortalized in canvases by George Stubbs, commissioned by their employer during their time at Kempshot. And it's quite possible that um, some of the landscapes um, here are trying to suggest um, Hampshire. Stag hunting was notoriously inconsiderate of local residents. So I mentioned that stag that ended up in a cottage kitchen. Um, in January 1791, a chase ended at Tunworth Farm, where the stag, who'd been named Black Prince, he'd been um, hunted a few times and not, not caught yet, um, ran into Farmer Terry's kitchen while the family was at dinner. And contemporary newspapers in Hampshire um, regularly ran complaints by landowners, farmers and cottagers about the damage and fear that um, a stag brought when chased into a village or farm. By 1791, the prince's pack of hounds, but mostly borrowed from friends and then the occasional one um, he started to breed himself, numbered 80, along with 37 hunters in his stable. In 1793, the prince changed his pack to the foxhound. Stag hunting did not always result in a kill, as I've mentioned, and indeed stags who could outrun the hounds were prized. I think, for example, that's why um, that particular stag that keeps appearing in the paper called Black Prince was named because he was he was quite a prized one that wasn't caught. Um, but of course, foxes were a pest and the um, the uh, ultimate goal was to 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 rid the country of them. It was not only sport which was pursued in Hampshire or not at least just foxes and deer. The prince's illegal wife, Maria Fitzherbert, was a regular resident at Kempshot, and a bill survives for a delivery to the house in 1790 for green sarsnet. Sarsnet is a light silk used for ladies' overdresses or light coats. Maria was temporarily succeeded at the house, superseded at the house in early 1795, when the prince spent part of his honeymoon following his marriage to Caroline of Brunswick in Hampshire. The prince unfortunately turned his honeymoon into a house party, including several of his um, drinking and hunting friends and his latest mistress, Lady Jersey, who had encouraged the match with Caroline. Um, and Lady Jersey's husband, Lord Jersey, held multiple positions in the prince's household through his wife's influence. Um, he was also genuinely a keen huntsman um, and eventually um, became the prince's master of the horse. The prince gave up Kempshot later in 1795, so not long after the um, unsuccessful honeymoon, um, and of course after having to lay off Henry Holland to do any alterations to the house. The new estate he leased at Northington Grange um, included an estate of 660 acres and cost £900 a year in rent, um, but the frequency of his hunting, um, because he just didn't have the finances to support it anymore, um, significantly reduced and he only leased Northington for two more years. 
During the prince's time in Hampshire, the neighbouring Hampshire, Hampshire hunt, with whom he also hunted, um, were granted the right to feature the Prince of Wales' feathers on their coat buttons, a right that they still retain. Another legacy was the traditional English country dancing tune, Campshot Hunt, which may have been played at the house, but was certainly written locally in celebration of the prince's presence in Hampshire. If it was too wet um, or the horses were not perhaps ready, um, the prince often went shooting from Kempshot as well. A portrait survives seen here on the left, which is believed to depict a gamekeeper working for the prince at the estate, although the sitter and the scene are currently unidentified. His coat buttons feature the three feathers of the Princes of Wales, and the sport would be for game birds intended mostly for the table. The prince himself was a really skilled shot with pistols and with rifles, as recorded in the front piece of Ezekiel Baker's remarks on rifle guns um, seen here on the right. And those, um, those peppered spots um, are the prince's uh, aims at a target. Baker assisted the prince throughout his life with gun sighting and designed a special carbine for the prince's private regiment, the 10th Light Dragoons. As with most aspects of his collecting, the prince acquired a wide range of guns, irrespective of their potential use, and some clearly only for decorative purposes, a lot of which survive in the Royal Collection. The leading London gunmaker, Durs Egg, was a major supplier. In one 1790 transaction, the prince acquired a German rifle, a Turkish gun, a pair of Madrid pistols, a pair of Italian 17th century pistols, and a pair of pistols decorated in gold and silver. And guns by all of these makers with these origins survive in the Royal Collection, but the purchasing was so vast that we often can't work out which invoice relates to which gun. A lot of these acquisitions were displayed in the prince's armory um, at Carlton House, um, his sort of bachelor London home um, down on the Mall, which doesn't survive, um, and later at Windsor Castle, arranged with the assistance of Ezekiel Baker. The prince maintained um, a huge interest. Oh, here on the left, we've got a stubs of um, the soldiers of the 10th Light Dragoon. So this is the prince's private regiment. It's um, full of partly his friends or officers, and then um, some men are, are signed up to be the, the sort of um, foot soldiers. Um, and there's the carbine that Ezekiel Baker helps design for the, for the regiment. Um, and the prince spends a lot of his birthdays, high days and holidays um, on the downs near Brighton, um, reviewing these troops which are not really totally part of the regular army that they're, they're essentially sort of invented for him and he's also really involved in the development of their uniform which is um particularly dashing so the prince maintained this interest um in sporting it literature as well he subscribed to daniel's rural sports um all three volumes and subscriptions to the 1807 publication by thomas williamson oriental field sports reflects his interest in the wider world and sports enjoyed in countries to which he must have heard from his friends and family um, what, what sort of burgeoning British Empire um, could offer people, but he was never able to travel there himself. So hunting things like tiger, buffalo, leopard and even peacocks. Many of these publications were supplied directly by the publisher Edward Orme, with whom he had quite a close relationship. And other purchases from Orme include Samuel Howitt's British Sportsman, and subscriptions to British field sports and foreign field sports and all of these sporting um, subscriptions he maintained throughout his life right right to the end. The Prince um, would also support sports um, by presenting trophies to clubs with which he was associated. The Red House Pigeon Club at Battersea was a shooting club established in 1805. The shooting was for live pigeons who would be released from, from wicker baskets um, and large sums were gambled on the results. It was one of these things to go and do in London, a bit like going to Vauxhall Gardens. If you were a gent or a slightly risque lady, you might go to the Red House Pigeon Club. The Red House, um, seen here um, on the right, um, was presented by the prince with a large silver bowl bearing an inscription from him, um, seen here on the left hand side and after various um, iterations of ownership, it's now in the possession of the Light Dragoons who are currently stationed at Catterick. Um, the bowl was made by Paul Store and therefore probably supplied through the Royal Goldsmiths, Rundle Bridge and Rundle, um, although I can't find the bill um, for it in the Royal Archives, unlike a lot of his trophy purchases. 
Paul Storr was clearly looking to classical precedents for this design, which is a three-dimensional version um, of the um, a mosaic found at Hadrian's Villa in Rome, um, uncovered in 1737 of doves drinking from a fountain. From the late 1780s, the increased national threat from France led to the reformation of local militia. Raised by the local gentry and initially without formal uniforms or arms. Alongside this, and also reacting to a contemporary interest in the romance of medieval England, the sport of archery was reintroduced as a, an easier way of improving hand eye coordination and target practice than perhaps supplying everyone immediately with, um, with firearms. Archery used the longbow, and the prince was instrumental in introducing competition rules for shooting over distances of 60, 80, or 100 yards. And these lengths are still used in archery competitions and called prince's lengths. The prince was a keen archer himself and an active member of several clubs. In April 1787, the first meeting of the British bowmen was held, and the following year, they gained royal patronage, became the Royal British Bowmen in recognition of the prince's involvement. Um, and this um, first uh, sort of semi-professional archery club were largely formed from the North Wales and Border Counties gentry. A portrait of the club's founder, Sir Foster Cunliffe of Acton Park, shows the uniform as a green jacket, a typical colour for archery and, of course, harking back to um, the sort of romance of the forest. The Royal British were the first archery club to also admit ladies. And on the right, you can see a print that's a little bit later, but there's quite a lot of a lot of women there. Um, ladies also had to wear green and they had to wear one black and one white feather in their hats. Um, and the prince presented trophies to the Royal British Bowmen, um, a bugle, a, a silver bugle, a, a sort of presentation one, um, he presented in 1790. And the club um, survived for uh, several decades, but floundered um, in the early 19th century when a sort of generation moved on and it wasn't taken up by their children. The prince was also a member of the Royal Kentish Bowmen, who met on Dartford Heath. The uniform rules and the scores for the target were established by the prince. He wrote the rule book, which is quite interesting, um, and feature um, such things as, um, well, you can imagine what the membership was like when I say that there was a fine of £100 if a male member got married. I think that tells you a lot. Um, the Kentish were established by the prince with the Maddox family in 1785. The Maddoxes had come from North Wales and acquired an estate in Kent. Uh, so the parents had been part of the Royal British Bowmen. Membership expanded rapidly in the 1780s and a rule book was drawn up. The members included men from Scotney Castle, the Hussey family of Scotney, where one of the annual prizes survives, presented by the prince, this bugle seen in the middle um, is a presentation bugle. It, it, it does sort of work, but that's, that's not the point of it. It's a trophy, essentially. Um, and these bugles were awarded annually by the prince to be um, to be. Uh, uh, competed for um, and Hussey's Asham cupboard so this um, this specialist kind of cupboard to keep your bows and your arrows in also survives um, at Scotney seen here on the right and it's possible that that was actually taken from the Bowman's Lodge on Dar Dartford Heath it's it's a relatively modest object and it seems to work with what we think the dimensions of the Bowman's Lodge um, at Dartford Heath actually were. The prince would try to attend the annual meetings to personally present these trophies at archery competitions. Um, and in 1792, he, he wore the uniform of the Royal Kentish Bowmen for the first time. The 1792 winner was a vicar who um, also presented the prince as a sort of transfer of, of gifts. He presents the prince with his book called Ballads of Archery, which is in the Royal Library at Windsor. And, um, slightly sort of florid romantic archery poetry it's quite niche um and you can see on the left a portrait of the prince in his royal kentish bowman's uniform so these rows of big fat gold buttons and um, we still have the invoices for the buttons from nuttings of covent garden um which had the rkb uh, initials of the club on them he's got his u longbow just propped behind, beside his right foot um, with its red heartwood and white sapwood. And the quiver is decorated with Prince of Wales feathers. We think that Russell um, definitely had access to the prince's uniform, perhaps on a dummy, um, but possibly the prince didn't personally sit for this portrait because the turn of the head 
is actually rather like a pastel that Russell did a couple of years earlier, which we know the prince definitely sat for. So we think he just uh, reused a, an existing head um, and probably just borrowed the uniform temporarily. A sketch um, of post-archery theatricals in 1799, um, seen here on the right, you can just about see behind the group of gentlemen, um, there's a funny portrait thing propped up, and it's actually this painting. So this painting went to um, the Kentish Bowman's um, clubhouse um, and re remained in the Maddox family until the early 20th century when they sold it, and Edward VII bought it. Um, it's usually hanging at Buckingham Palace on the public route that's open to visitors in the summer, but at the moment the palace is um, being subject to some pretty extreme building work, so um, it's not currently um, in the room it's usually in. But it's quite interesting that it looks like it was too big for the room, and it's probably propped against the wall. The Kentish did not solely compete amongst uh, between themselves, though. Uh, large tournaments were held um, wherever the, the land was suitable. Blackheath was a really um, popular location for archery competitions, for example. Um, and in 1793, the meeting at Blackheath included the Royal Kentish against the Royal British Bowmen, the Honourable Artillery Company, the Edinburgh Archers, the Robin Hood Society, who were based um, unsurprisingly in Nottinghamshire, and the Loyal Archers. So men um, and some women would travel quite significant distances to compete in these archery competitions. The Prince's younger brother, the Duke of Clarence, brought his club that he was patron of, which was the Surrey Bowmen. Um, and he, he despaired slightly of having to dine in tents because this was a temporary sporting competition on Blackheath. But he said, well, at least we've got venison and turtle. The Duke of Gloucester um, was patron of the Southampton Archers. The um, Duke was um, in the Navy for several years. So obviously when he was on shore leave, he, could, he was involved in um, archery at Southampton. Um, and the Prince was also patron of the Royal Toxophilite Society, who were the only archery society from this period to have survived. The society formed in London in 1781, and six years later, the Prince became their patron. And one of a series of 10 silver bugles presented by the Prince to the society as an annual prize survives. And its green and silver thread tassels and oak leaf relief are very similar, almost identical to the Scotney Castle bugle. Royal patronage of the Toxophilites continues to this day, with the society shooting by invitation at Windsor Castle biannually. Um, the Prince's interest in archery remained even after his health made it really unlikely, and probably his size too actually, made it really unlikely that he was still shooting. In 1826, a bill from Thomas Waring, the archer and archery equipment supplier, for over 60 pounds of equipment, including ladies' sashes and arm guards, suggests that he was still enjoying looking and watching archery, even if it was his friends and family who were um, enjoying it. And he was actually probably a spectator by this point. And Archer had the most wonderful um, headed note paper. And this is, this is one of the headings. Although not as active a fan or a player of the game of cricket as his brother, Frederick, Duke of York, as a young man, the Prince both played in and watched matches at Brighton. The Brighton team was actually created as a direct result of the Prince's presence in the town and was occasionally referred to as the Prince's team. Sorry, excuse me. Although it does appear that formal royal patronage was never given. The Brighton team first played on the level, just behind the pavilion, <coughs> in a space that's now entirely taken up by building, and slowly had to move further and further out of town, up to the Downs. There are no surviving images of this early period for Brighton cricket, or any royal cricket equipment. The sport in Brighton formed part of overall entertainment available in the town. Sorry, I'm going to have to just take a drink. Um, so the sport of cricket um, formed part of the overall entertainment available in the town. Um, and actually, it was one to which ladies were able to attend. Maria Fitzherbert. Maria Fitzherbert was a really regular spectator at the cricket in Brighton. And she dined at Marylebone Cricket Club's marquee during one of their away games with Brighton. Um, and such temporary structure um, can be seen here on the on the right hand side of the left hand image. These little marquees that would be um, erected for dinner um, and entertaining the teams. <clears throat> and this um, painting on the left was actually 
acquired by the prince in 1800, showing a match outside a public house. Ladies' presence at cricket was completely acceptable. The Duchess of Gordon and the Marchioness of Salisbury both watched matches when their husbands were playing, but also would attend matches themselves um, independently. It was something that was acceptable for, for ladies to do. As King, George's interest in cricket continued and he permitted um, matches to be held in Windsor Great Park. In 1802, the Prince was present at Lord's Cricket Ground in Marylebone um, to watch the ascent of a balloon um, piloted uh, by Monsieur Garneran. Garneran travelled to Brentwood in 15 minutes, so I think the wind was probably quite strong, uh, carrying a letter signed by the Prince, which is quite fun, and I'll, I'll read it to you. <coughs> We, the undersigned, having been present at the ascension of Monsieur Garneran with his balloon this afternoon, beg leave to recommend him to the notice of any gentleman in whose neighbourhood he may happen to descend. And of course, if you think about what was happening in the early 19th century, the sort of um, horror that might ensue if a Frenchman descended from a balloon in the sky um, it means that they obviously felt that he should take off with this letter in his pocket, saying that the Prince of Wales had seen him take off and he was quite safe and not a Napoleonic invader. <coughs> the Royal Kentish Bowman's butts on Dart Dartford Heath were also occasionally used for cricket. In 1805, Kent played Bexley there for a prize of 500 guineas. Several of the bowmen were also enthusiastic cricketers, so of course sporting prowess sometimes takes you in, into several different sports, including, for example, the Duke of Dorset, the Earl of Winchelsea and the Earl Darnley. Connections between cricketers surpassed all levels of society. Wealthy captains of cricket teams employed players not only for cricket, but also as servants or tenants. Sir Horace Mann's Kent players, George and John Ring, otherwise worked as his huntsman and his whipper in. And his bailiff, Islewood, had been tempted from the renowned team at Hambledon in Surrey. <coughs> Edward Stevens, known as Lumpy, a famous Surrey bowler, nicknamed for his penchant of spinning the ball off Lumpy ground, was otherwise the Earl of Tankerville's gardener. Lumpy also lent his name in sort of celebrity style to one of the prince's favorite hunters at Kempshot. And that horse Lumpy, we know was purchased from a certain Captain Brummel, a teenager then, but later known as Beau Brummel, already a friend of the prince. Lumpy the horse was later sold at Tattersall's for 200 guineas. During the prince's youth, he was an avid box boxing spectator, watching matches on the downs north of Brighton. Boxing brought the prince into contact with men from very different backgrounds, including a former enslaved black man and a Jew. The rules were minimal. It was essentially slog it out until you're done um, and matches could therefore last for hours. The prince's 15 stone, six foot two inch tall chairman, so doorkeeper essentially, from Carlton House, Tom Tring, participated in matches on behalf of his employer. One such match at Shepherd's Bush in 1786 was stopped when the local militia smashed the ring on the, um, on the behest of the local magistrate. They didn't like people gathering for boxing matches. Tring's physicality brought him another opportunity and he sat as a model for the artists Joshua Reynolds, William Beachy and John Hopner. And these watercolours of him by Bernie show him as a nude warrior. Tring worked for the Prince, kept his door at Carlton House for 15 years, after which he disappeared onto the streets of London. We know he was working as a porter, but we're not, we're not too sure um, what happened. In 1787, whilst at Barnet to watch racing, horse racing, the Prince watched a boxing match between Daniel Mendoza, a Portuguese Jew, and John Humphreys, nicknamed the Bath Butcher. Mendoza was presented to the prince who awarded his 500 pound prize money. And Mendoza later comments, we're not totally sure if it's true, but comments that he's the first Jew to meet the prince. 13 years later, the prince would acquire a print of Mendoza sparring against Humphreys. And even later, a portrait, a, a print, a mezzotint of Humphreys after his portrait by Hopner, both of which remain in the Royal Collection. Um, 
On the, June the 9th, 1788, John Gentleman Jackson and Thomas Futrell boxed at Croydon. The prince was among spectators and the event was engraved by James Gilray, the prince taking a very obvious front row seat with his friend, um, Colonel Hanger. Oops, sorry. This match was Jackson's first major fight and the prince presented him with a token. The prince's brief attendance at boxing ended on the 6th of August, 1789, when he witnessed the match between Tom Tyne, known as the Taylor, and George Earl. George Earl died towards the end of the match from his injuries. The prince presented Earl's widow with a pension and never watched a match again. Whether this was due to diplomatic advice or his own sensibilities is unclear. His brothers, Frederick and William, continued to attend boxing matches. The prince, however, um, there's a, an example of a print acquired by the prince um, sometime after watching um, Humphreys, but it remains in the, in the Royal Collection. <coughs> the prince did not forget the network of his generation of boxers, however. At his coronation banquet, concerned that his estranged wife Caroline or her supporters might try to force their way into Westminster Hall, he employed Gentleman Jackson and 19 other former pugilists as pages to guard the doors. Must have looked extraordinary. The um, 1821 coronation was sort of slightly Tudor themed. And he made these pugilists wear essentially like Tudor pages uniform. Um, I can't imagine what they, what they look like. Um, and the Prince of course had seen Jackson's first major fight 33 years earlier. So he's obviously sort of still aware of these men. Jackson, Cribb and Spring, all top boxers of their generation, were employed to guard the doors of the hall. And the, um, the Lord Great Chamberlain presented the group with a gold coronation medal that they, they raffled at their post-coronation um, dinner, which was held at Cribb's um, kind of boxing and gentlemen's club um, just after the actual banquet. <clears throat> One of the former boxers, Bill Richmond, was the only known man of colour at this coronation celebration. Um, and interestingly, um, probably one of the ways that he knew how to get hold of these men again, um, so long after they'd last been in the ring, was that a lot of them became London publicans. There was a real network in the taverns of London of, of pubs being run by former boxers. I'm sure they were both partly celebrity and partly perhaps their skills were quite useful um, in a pub. Uh, and therefore, he obviously um, managed to put the word out as to, as to who could guard the coronation banquet. As with archery, um, contemporary events contributed to the reinvigoration of fencing as a gentlemanly chivalric pursuit in the late 18th century, alongside a renewed interest in historic arms and armor. And at court, George III reinvigorated the Order of the Garter for this idea of chivalric knighthood close to the monarch. In 1787, two fencers, the Chevalier d'Eon, seen on the uh, left and the Chevalier, uh, sorry, on the right, and the Chevalier de Saint-Georges, seen on the left in this bout, were invited to fence at Carlton House, watched by the prince. You can see him in his blue coat behind. In this painting, Dayon is depicted wearing a dress as he spent the second half of his life as a woman, remaining a contemporary fencer throughout. And Saint-Georges was a mixed race man from Guadeloupe. The image was later engraved by Gilray for further distribution and actually the presence of a mixed race man and a, and a man then um, living as a woman provoked very little comment. Most of the interest was in the um, sporting prowess. A portrait in the Royal Collection of Saint-Georges on the right um, shows him sort of ready for his next bout and actually the prince joined them in the ring um, and, and, and had, a, had a little session against Saint George on the occasion of this, of this match at Carlton House. So we think that's when um, this portrait of Saint George was commissioned. In the final years of his life, the king weighed over 20 stone. Unable to ride and only to drive out in a low pony phaeton, he began to enjoy angling, setting out from Royal Lodge in the middle of Windsor Great Park and spending hours at the fishing temple designed by the architect Geoffrey Wyattville and the interior designer Frederick Crace, an absolute confection um, on the edge of Virginia water. Um, and the building doesn't survive at all. Bills in the Royal Archives show the lake was artificially stocked with fish. The most remarkable sporting survivor from this time in George's life is his fishing tackle, 
It was retailed by Maria Astonson at Temple Bar on the Strand. Her husband, Charles, had died in 1822 and relatively unusual for a royal warrant holder. She continued the business in her name um, and held the royal warrant in, in her own name. She first supplied the kit in 1824 and in 28 it was sent back for refurbishment. No doubt the Estonson workshop made the reel, the rod and probably some of the other fishing equipment. But when you think of the amount of specialist skills to pull together this kind of kit, um, leather, velvet, silk, metal thread embroidery, ivory, fly tying, net making, ferruling get engraving. Um, it must have involved the coordination of so many people beyond her little shop on the Strand. Um, and we can't think that this type of fishing tackle is normal. And in fact, it was pretty extraordinary even at the time. Um, it was known that she was making it. And so when it was finished, she, um, she offered admission cards for people to come to the shop for a weekend to just look at it. Um, and several hundred people attended. Um, and the standard described it in some detail. And I'm just going to take a drink before I read it to you. The case is covered with the breast crimson Morocco leather and is three feet long, nine inches broad and three inches deep. The edge is sloped with double borders of gold ornaments representing alternately a salmon and basket. And I can tell you it, it still is. I'm sorry there isn't a photo. The outer border forms a rich gold wreath of the rose, thistle and shamrock intertwined by oak leaves and acorns. The centre of the lid presents a splendid gold impression of the British coat of arms. The case is fastened with one of Brammer's patent locks. You can still see that there. Handles, eyes, etc. are all double gilt. The interior of the case is lined throughout with the finest Genoese sky blue velvet, the inner part of the lid tufted. <laughs> the books, as they're termed, for angling and fly fishing are the most chaste and beautiful that can be imagined. The angling book is covered with Genoese crimson velvet, the locks surmounted by a diadem of solid gold, the top ornamented with the royal arms of the United Kingdom, richly worked and emblazoned, and beneath the shield, the rose, the thistle and the shamrock. Within the book are an infinite variety of artificial baits of superior imitation, together with angling rod, landing stick, etc., <coughs> richly carved with royal emblematic devices. The fly book on the outside assimilates to the other with this difference, that the lid is surmounted with a double GR enclosed in a semicircle of a richly embroidered wreath. So that's the book on the left they're talking about, representing the rose, shamrock and thistle. The book is full of flies, which although artificial, almost equal the natural insects in imitation. The tout ensemble of the apparatus is the most beautiful specimen of the art that perhaps has ever been manufactured in this or in any other country. Um, and the king would fish with live bait. So alongside his bills for fish um, are those for things like wasps, cockchafers, grasshoppers, houseflies and blue bottles. I can't imagine how they bred them in the early 19th century. Um, slightly mind boggling, um, but they did. Um, spinning minnow lures and um, rods that he imported um, using importers who were working with East India bamboo. The Chinoiserie Fishing Temple at Virginia Water in the mid-1820s was used for small gatherings of his friends, but it didn't provide casting positions. If you look at the architecture, I can't imagine how an earth one would cast off from there. So what he actually used, and you can see it just in the foreground of the left-hand image, were little boats, little barges to take him out on the water. <coughs> in 1828, this barge was joined by the Victorine, um, who was um, just what every king wants, a miniature three-mast man of war. And she'd been brought from Greenwich, where she'd been a public attraction. And the sight of this king, really portly, um, quite heavy man by this point, suffering periodically from gout and accompanied by his mistress, Lady Cunningham, his, his last mistress, um, was a really easy target for cartoonists. Some speculated that actually Lady Cunningham and her ample proportions um, with the quarry rather than the fish. You can see in the middle, um, he's hooked, his line is hooked into the bottom of, um, of her dress. Um, and of course he's being pushed along in, in sort of a, an adult equivalent of a, of a baby walker. And then other um, really easy comparisons to make were a series of prints that lampooned him as a kingfisher. However, and I'm probably from my opinion, leaving the best until last, it was equestrian pursuits that were most consistently followed 
by the prince throughout his life. Horse racing, of course, was one of these. As a teenager, the prince saw the success of his uncle, the Duke of Cumberland's stud, and knew that his father disapproved of the amount of money it takes to breed and race horses. It was the prince, so it was George IV, that registered the royal silks of crimson waistcoat, purple sleeves and black cap with gold frogging, which remain the royal racing colours today. The prince's name first appears in the stud book in the mid-1780s, and between 1784 and 92, his horses won 185 races. His first classic placing was Miss Kitty, who came third in the 1785 Oaks. The prince also proved himself as a breeder. So Annette, for example, became the first classic winner bred by a member of the royal family when she won the Epsom Oaks in 1787. And he followed this with a derby win with Sir Thomas the following year, also a homebred horse. Previous wins could also justify a purchase. So he bought Saltram in 1785, two years after Saltram had won the derby for a previous owner. <coughs> In 1786, uh, with restricted finances, the prince was obliged to completely disperse his stud. One of the yearlings sold without having been named or raced was purchased by a man called Mr. Franco, and this yearling developed a trick to open his stable door. So he was named Escape, the horse, and the prince later brought him back, where he won four of his five starts. And after his reacquisition, Escape became part of a synonymous scandal, after which the prince never personally attended another new market meeting, although he continued to send his horses to race there. So this was during the 1791 new market meeting. Escape came forth in his first race on the first day. The next day, again with the prince's favourite jockey, Samuel Chifney, Escape won. And the situation was judged to be cheating. The horse had been held back on the first day in order to win on the second, which had greater prize money. Charles Bunbury, the senior steward of the jockey club, told the prince that no one would race against Chiffney again. So this is quite a clever way of getting around a royal scandal that they kind of blame the jockey. Chiffney had won many races for the prince prior to this date and even been presented with a second version of George Stubbs' baronet with the jockey Samuel Chiffney up. So. The one that you see on the left is, is the one that was the prince's and it's remained in the Royal Collection. Uh, Chiffany had another one that the prince paid for, which is now in America. Um, and actually the National Horse Racing Museum has a copy um, by Sartorius after these stubs, um, which is on long-term loan from the Queen to, to the Horse Racing Museum. Um, the escape scandal ended Chiffney's career, but the prince presented him with a pension of £200 per annum. It, it really ruined his life and he, um, it, he had a, a quite a sorry life thereafter. And Thomas Rowlandson, of course, ever keen to lampoon the, the, the prince, uh, produced this pair of cartoons seen on the right titled How to Escape Winning. And you can see that the horse's legs have been tied with the garter. Um, and then on the right, it, they've been released and he can gallop. Um, and his um, streaming with the garter and the prince looking a bit shifty in the right hand corner. So horse sales were conducted either directly to friends or relations or through tattersalls. Of course, established in 1766, so very well established by the time that the prince came to um, the racing world. During this period, they were located at High Park Corner. In the middle of their sale ring, they placed a bust of the prince, which remains now in their new yard at Newmarket. In 1796, the prince made a second comeback with a re-established stud, which he maintained for the rest of his life, increasing his breeding programme and also purchasing young horses for further training. During this time, his winnings became significant. The Brighton Pavilion Stakes of 1803 came with 1,900 guineas prize money, and the prince um, also attended the St Ledger at Doncaster in 1806 with his brother, the Duke of Clarence, and even... I can't tell you how significant it is for a Prince of Wales to even go to Doncaster in the Hanoverian period. I mean, nobody, for example, goes to Scotland um, who's in the direct line of succession. It's partly too risky and um, uh, there's other politics involved. So, you know, this is a way of the Prince seeing the country and the people seeing him, which is really quite interesting in itself. As Prince Regent, he owned the three best long distance horses of his generation, Zingany, the Colonel and Fleur de Lis. And in the first seven years of the 19th century, his horses won over 100 races and over 10,000 guineas of prize money. 
Fleur de Lis win at Lincoln in 1829 was rewarded with this cup on the left, a silver gilt trophy presented to the races by the Duke of St Albans. Um, and you might recognise it if you were able to visit the George IV exhibition at Newmarket, which sadly had to close when COVID hit. The one in the middle was also part of that loan, um, and that was the Goodwood Cup from 1829, also won by Fleur de Lis, um, and of course brought this even larger silver gilt trophy. That, that trophy is huge, I can hardly lift it up. Um, very big indeed. The prince would also frequently provide trophies himself, particularly for races known as King's Plates. In 1808, the prince purchased 20 of them, a job lot of trophies, um, but they cost him £2,126 from the royal goldsmiths, Rundlebridge and Rundle. Occasionally, the prince even chose to represent his own cup. So obviously, if you um, have given the trophy yourself to the race and then you win it, it's a little bit awkward, perhaps. Um, so on the right, there's an example of this where the prince purchased that trophy to be presented at the race at Brighton. His horse, Orville, won it, but he chose to represent it to the previous owner of the horse, Christopher Wilson of Tadcaster. The cup um, was supplied through Rundles, um, and it's it's obvious that Rundles in their in their invoices know what they're providing things for. So they they purposefully choose um, equestrian scenes, uh, sometimes um, from from the classical world, sometimes contemporary ones. Um, so very aware of, of what these commissions are. In 1821, as part of a sort of post uh, coronation uh, tour of the UK perhaps, uh, the newly crowned king visited Ireland and attended racing at the Curragh. He was entertained in the new stand and presented a trophy as a prize for the Royal Whip Stakes. Um, so there's a little um, description in the papers about how this whip is beautiful, it's covered in gold. Um, the Royal Whip Stakes, of course, remains the longest running horse race in Ireland, but the current trophy, sadly, um, is a replacement whip presented by his brother, William IV, a decade later. We don't know what happened to George IV's um, original trophy for the Royal Whip. <coughs> the new stand had been funded by private donations from the Anglo-Irish aristocracy, the largest from the Duke of Leinster at 200 guineas. Notice that the visit was really short, so 200 men built the stand in three weeks, including a banqueting room, a lady sitting room and a viewing room for the prince and his party to watch the racing. His experience must have been really memorable because the papers are full of the fact that he didn't see the end of the racing due to indigestion, so he had to um, try the facilities, um, but he also subscribed to Irish racing subscriptions for the rest of his life, including the Irish racing calendar. His use of tips and insider information um, was evident when his estate was being tied up. His um, executors, who was the Duke of Wellington and Sir William Knighton, paid a man hilariously called Ruff um, for £100, which was um, the bill for um, furnishing insider racing intelligence. In 1825, the first royal carriage procession at the main Ascot race meeting was held. Previous Ascot meetings had been preceded by running the buckhounds, the Ascot buckhounds, um, down the course and actually hunting with the buckhounds is one of the um, um, requirements to be able to race your horse at Ascot. The grandstand at Ascot at this time consisted of temporary booths, which would just be put up as required. And you can see one there on the, on the, under the tree in the Sandby um, watercolour, one of these temporary booths that would be um, put, put there. Um, and it was George Slingsby, who was a Windsor bricklayer, a bit of a speculator in the area, um, who applied to um, the king to build a permanent brick built stand for up to 1600 people. That was the first iteration of a grandstand at Ascot. It, and that run remained in use until 1838. The Royal Box, which um, was slightly separate from the main grandstand, <coughs> was situated directly opposite the finishing post and the judges, very familiar to us all today. Um, and several redesigns were suggested during the Prince's lifetime, um, including one by um, Thomas Sandby that you can see on the right. This was the suggestion for a little bit of alterations, but you can very much see what the King would have occupied at Ascot. Um, eventually, uh, the new Royal Box was designed by John Nash. And of course, these carriage processions, um, as they still do today, um, gave everyone a chance um, not only to see the king and the royal family, but also some of their favoured guests. So, for example, 
1814, just after Waterloo, um, the generals Blücher and Platov, the King of Prussia and the Russian Tsar were amongst the royal party and several of them um, rode up and down the course to the cheers of the people. The prince regularly commissioned portraits of some of his um, favourite horses and um, horses that belong to his friends and racing rivals, often to hang in coherent groups in Royal Lodge in the Great Park. Three paintings by James Ward from the early 1820s um, depict two different types of horse. So soothsayer and monitor, both stallions, both then standing at stud, never belonged to the prince at all. But commissioned at the same time is the portrait of non pariah on the bottom left, which was his racing horse. And you can just about see um, under non pariah's nose, is Windsor Castle. So this is a sort of in situ um, approximation of what non pari looks like in his paddock, although I think the park looks a little bit romanticised there. By 1822, all but one of the canvases by George Stubbs, acquired by the Prince, were hung together at Royal Lodge um, to be enjoyed in his more private home. And people write about going to see the Prince um, at Royal Lodge and say, you know, how full it is of equestrian painting and they're all hung together in groups. Towards the end of the 18th century, smaller, lighter, often two-wheeled carriages, which had previously only been seen on the continent, began to be seen on British roads. <coughs> the Phaeton in particular was then developed into two types of taller, more suspended vehicle, high perch Phaeton and the crane neck Phaeton. Generally called high flyers as a group term, a term also used to identify the young and usually male drivers, um, they were difficult to drive and really, really easy to overturn. The prince acquired a high perch phaeton in 1792 through his friend, the skilled driver, Sir John Laid. The prince's patron, uh, phaeton, was usually driven with a pair or with four blacks, you can see just two blacks there. Two teams of black Phaeton horses are named in records from the Royal Muse during this period, and they might have been the princes, although they seem to have been stabled at his father's expense. The two coachmen in charge of these teams were Thomas Frere and Richard Gray, and each man, um, which is very similar to how the Muse is organised today, each of those men took charge of um, a, a, a group of um, Phaeton horses each. Frere's team was listed in pairs, and the pairs were named Farmer and Early, Chance and Woolly, Peacock and Perrin, Sprightly and Bishop, Poppet and Banyan, and Heady and Spinner. On the back of the Phaeton was perched a tiger boy who would lean into corners to help prevent overturning. And of course, <clears throat> that image is something I think we're more familiar with today with competitive carriage driving. His services could be disposed of if the, um, the driver wanted a little bit more privacy with his um, passenger. And the tiger boy is probably this slightly younger man on the right hand side there, um, adjusting the phaeton. This painting, of course, shows the phaeton beautifully articulated to show its suspension. It's actually a um, slightly odd position to put it in, but I think it's probably to show how beautifully made it was. And this is probably the best visual record of a high perch in existence. And it's um, absolutely chosen deliberately. I suppose it's a bit like having your Lamborghini wheel hubs photographed or something like that. I don't, I don't know, that's not my, not my world. Um, the only surviving high flyer of this period is one belonging to the prince's brother, the Duke of Kent, not quite as attenuated as the prince's phaeton, but quite similar there on the left, um, which is still survives in, in the Hanoverian carriage collection. <coughs> and the Duke of Kent, um, who owned that later, of course, the father of the young Queen Victoria, or the lady, the, the baby girl that became Queen Victoria. These new smaller carriages disposed of the requirement to have a coachman, a gentleman could drive himself, perhaps with a lady friend sitting beside him. And indeed, sometimes the prince's friends would act the part of servants just to confuse and amuse themselves and other people. Um, so there's accounts of um, the Prince of Wales and Charles James Fox, for example, um, pretending to be postillions and driving their carriage, uh, his carriage back to London um, from Brighton. Um, Sir John Laid, who helps him purchase his phaeton, often plays the part of coachman, even though in reality he's, he's, he's too grand a gentleman really to be a, a coachman as such. Um, the Prince supposedly once overturned his high perch phaeton whilst Maria Fitzherbert was a passenger, which led to um, some wonderful speculation as to the logistics of the accident you can see on the right. It compared the incident to the fall of Phaeton of classical Greek myth. 
In his latter years, the prince reduced the high suspensions <clears throat> of the carriages of his youth and used a low pony phaeton, which he used to transport himself around the park at Windsor. This style of carriage, still known as the George IV Phaeton, was used extensively by the elderly Queen Victoria. Queen Victoria had first sat in one <coughs> with her uncle, so with George IV. When Victoria was seven-year-old, he would drive her down to Sandpit Gate to see his menagerie. And then next day, she sat beside him again, for example, to go to Virginia Water with him. So these are little excur excursions with... Um, a girl who at that point may not have ever been queen, but it was it was possible. Um, and she's being taken out by her uncle on these little trips around Windsor Great Park. The sporting pursuits of George IV permeated every aspect of his private and some of his public life. They introduced sport and the attendance at sport by members of the royal family into the royal calendar, <clears throat> including markers which remain to this day, such as a presence at important matches, and that excitement of Ascot Week. The Prince's sport influenced his choice and promotion of staff, of friends and acquaintances, the places in Britain he visited, and added another aspect to his interest in commissioning and acquiring the finest equipment, trophies and imagery to celebrate his involvement in the wide variety of sports available to a gentleman of his generation. Um, and I just wanted to finish with um, a couple more things if you're if you're interested in this period or so want to visit um, the muse has been closed for the last year but we're very very much hoping it will open again next summer um, tickets are already on sale um, we don't uh, honestly trot two of the greys around the quadrangle 24 7 but um, you probably will see carriages moving um, there are loans from the Royal Collection at the National Horse Racing Museum Newmarket, and there's three examples just on your screen. And um, we're in the last, last days of um, a large quantity of objects from Buckingham Palace, which are on, long to, uh, on loan to the Royal Pavilion in Brighton until the 9th of January. It's an amazing opportunity to see things that were commissioned for the pavilion um, back there. Um, but thank you very much for listening, and I'm very sorry about my voice. Thank you very much, um, Sally. Uh, you've spoken for over an hour with such a terrible throat. You have, <laughs> and thank you for soldiering on. Um, I thought the drink was going to help you, but uh, <laughs> I, could see, I could see it was running out. Um, <laughs> I think you've spoken for so long. Um, uh, I'll spare you the questions, but we will pass them on to you so that we can get back to uh, those who have uh, uh, put in questions. Um, so thank you, Sally. Um, the lecture has been recorded. I'm sure we'll edit it so that we can get some of the <laughs> coughs and splutters out. Thank you. <laughs> and we'll be on YouTube and you'll be able to access that through our website. Uh, our regular viewers will know that Sally Bills has orchestrated these talks. She couldn't be with us today, and I'd like to thank her for help throughout the year. But I'd also like to thank Sophie Hill, who has been hiding behind uh, Sally's uh, uh, title uh, on screen. Um, she has helped us with the technology today, and that's very appropriate uh, because her mother, Diana Hill, is a member of the executive committee and can be considered the godmother of these talks. Uh, while we're having those inevitable discussions about whether we should do this series, Diana was uh, steadfast in proposing them, keeping up with the idea and making sure that they did happen. So thank you, Sophie and Diana. I'd like to thank everybody for supporting this series and to wish you all a very happy Christmas and a COVID-free new year. I hope I'm not being over optimistic. The next talk will be on Thursday, 11th of January, when the talk will be given by Alan, Anna Tietzi from the South African Naf National Gallery. Anna will be talking about the A. Bailey Sporting Art Collection uh, that is housed in Cape Town. It's a fabulous collection, and I hope you'll be able to join us on Thursday, the 11th of January, to hear Anna's talk. So thank you, Sally, for being such a good sport and continuing uh, with such a bad cough throat um, stay home uh, get well and thank you uh, for spending time with us this morning so thank you very thank much you.
It's thank been you. a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.